switched over to uh, Law and Order. Now the Law and Order Broadway is the Elvis is the staff. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but, yeah, I just... And then he sends it to me out to me. It's not like he's got years and years. That's true. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But it's it's true. And wouldn't that be something for it to be the one the one night that she doesn't go over? Oh, yeah. Hey, would you move that item? Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You want to see your side? I thought about it. Yeah, okay.
Well, good, morning. good morning, and welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, those who are here and those joining us online. Uh, it's a pastor's uh, worst nightmare, three-day weekend and nice weather. Uh, so uh, even those who were planning on being out of town are probably out doing something, but that's okay. Uh, we will remember them. A few announcements as we prepare for worship this morning. It's uh, end of the month, so... Uh, it'll be the last opportunity uh, for giving for Rock Solid Teen Center. Uh, this time they will come back around later in the year. Um, we're also continuing to collect for UMCOR's work with Ukrainian refugees. Uh, got some new information the other day, and of course I forgot to print it out. So, But uh, um, the uh, UMCOR is still actively working in uh, uh, several of the countries around Ukraine uh, with United Methodist Churches there to uh, help the refugees. Also want to remind you, uh, next Sunday, uh, you might want to get here early if you're not used to it. During the Sunday school hour, that starts at 9.30 after you get here a little early to eat your, your cookies and have some coffee. But uh, uh, missionary Ken Vance will be here. Uh, he has uh, many mission, uh, ministries in Zambia uh, with the uh, uh, Tafakumba Training Center. Before that, he worked with the Enrights in uh, what was Zaire and is now the uh, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, but he'll be here next Sunday, um, and no matter what you read that I've typed somewhere, it is June 5th, uh, but next Sunday, um, and uh, he will uh, talk to us about his ongoing ministries. Uh, you may remember last Easter, we uh, supported him, we had our little Easter eggs for you to collect your money in, and uh, we sent uh, Ken $221 for his chickens. Does that come across when I say it better? It's, it's better, because think of the word chicken, it has kins at the end of it, so it's chickens, but that's a ministry that's been copied in several um, annual conferences throughout uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, for the most part, pastors are not paid, um, and so they uh, have to raise some money, but of course don't want to spend too much time doing that, but they have to support themselves and their families. And so uh, what's been found is if they can get started with uh, some chickens and some chicken feed, uh, pretty soon they can be self-supporting between selling chicken eggs and once in a while selling chickens for meat. Uh, so uh, um, with all the uh, that was given, uh, let's see, I think two-thirds of what we gave last year went to that would be a, a, a new uh, outreach by our district for the Republic of Congo, and uh, uh, and one third went to uh, uh, Ken Vance, but uh, wound up the district. We were the only ones doing Ken Vance that I'm aware of. Um, the district was trying to raise about uh, I think it was six thousand dollars, which would uh, provide for about. 20, maybe 25 percent of the pastors. I think there's 100. And, I guess I remember 109 pastors in that annual conference. Uh, but we wound up raising close to 30 thousand dollars, and so they were able to do every pastor. And uh, there was a report a couple of weeks ago from the district that, uh, um, from the district superintendent over there that that we were working with, that uh, every single pastor, every pastor retiree, and every widow. Uh, now has
has chickens and is self-supporting, so that's all kind of cool. So, but Ken will talk about the many things that go there. Um, that's where uh, this training center he's at is where most lay pastors uh, in the whole continent of Africa are trained for the United Methodist Church. So uh, lots of good things going on for there. Um, I won't say you, that he'll turn down money, but we won't be asking for any money next week. We do have that opportunity later in the year to support him. Uh, but if you want to give on Sunday, I'm sure he has a way for you to do that. Um, any other announcements this morning? Do want, let's see, there's one in the bulletin I want to bring your attention to. Yeah, on the inside of the front page. Um, uh, Deborah Pyra, our uh, administrative assistant, will be on vacation next Thursday and then all of the following week. So if you'd like to spend a few hours uh, babysitting the office, uh, greeting people who come in and answering the phone, uh, we could definitely use you. So you can contact her Tuesday or Wednesday this week and let her know when you might be able to come. Uh, and she'll get you signed up for that. And of course, the church office is closed tomorrow. Any other announcements? Seeing none? Welcome you who have joined us online. Be sure to sign in by letting us know you're watching by leaving a comment. And um, uh, if you have any prayer requests, uh, get those in the sooner the better so we make sure we can cover them. Let us now prepare our hearts for worship as we listen to the prayer. <laughs>
now the proclamation of the ascension of Jesus, taken from the first chapter of the book of Acts. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day when he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, Jesus said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked Jesus, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? He replied, it is not for you to know the time or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When he had said this, as they were watching, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, and they were gazing up toward heaven, suddenly two men in white robes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up toward heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go. Please stand as you're able and join me in the call of worship. <clears throat> praise the Lord, all the people. The Lord our Savior has been raised on high. Jesus Christ, who was crucified, has risen from the dead, now sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Jesus will come again, bringing the fullness of God's kingdom. Our opening hymn is Hail the Day that Sees Him Rise. The words will be on the screen and in your hymnal on page 312.
Please join with me in the opening prayer. Astounding God, we come before you this day as witnesses to Christ's ascension from this realm to the heavenly kingdom. We stand in awe and wonder at what we hear and see. Open the eyes of our hearts to see the power and truth of your words. Give us courage and joy that we might be witnesses to your eternal love through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. You may be seated. In our first scripture lesson taken from the 16th chapter of Acts, Paul and Silas are in prison and the jailer becomes a believer. One day when we were on the way to the place for prayer, we met a slave woman. She had a spirit that enabled her to predict the future. She made a lot of money from her owners for her fortune telling. She began following Paul and us shouting, these people are servants of the most high God. They are proclaiming a way of salvation for you. She did this for many days. This annoyed Paul so much that he finally turned and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to leave her. It left her at that very moment. Her owners realized that their hope for making money was gone. They grabbed Paul and Silas and dragged them before the officials in the city center. When her owners approached the legal authorities, they said, these people are causing an uproar in our city. They are Jews who promote customs that we Romans can't accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attacks upon Paul and Silas. So the authorities ordered that they be stripped of their clothes and beaten with a rod. When Paul and Silas had been severely beaten, the authorities threw them in prison and ordered the jailer to secure them with a great care. When he received these instructions, he threw them into the innermost cell and secured their feet in stocks. Around midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. All at once, there was such a violent earthquake that it shook the prison's foundation. The doors flew open, and every chain came loose. When the jailer awoke and saw the doors open to the prison, he thought the prisoners had escaped. So he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But Paul shouted loud, loudly, don't harm yourself, we are all here. The jailer called for some lights and rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He led them outside and asked honorable masters, what do I do to be rescued? They replied, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your entire household. They spoke the Lord's word to him and everyone in his house Right then, in the middle of the night, the jailer welcomed them and washed their wounds. He and everyone in his household were immediately baptized. He brought them into his home and gave them a meal. He was overjoyed because he and everyone in his household had become to believe in God. choir is a little short today here because our university students are in, in New York singing at Carnegie Hall. So we're going to have everyone be in the choir today. And if you turn in your hymnal to number 697, which is my country tis of thee, and I, I believe the words are going to be on the screen. And here's the way we're going to do it. First verse is just going to be the choir that's up here. Okay. Second verse would just be the men singing, all ten of us. And <laughs> sing loud, sing loud. Third verse, just the ladies of the church. And fourth verse, those that can stand, everybody will sing. Okay, so here we go. 697. We can be very flexible. So let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. Uh, let's have the second verse be the ladies, the third verse be the men, and then everybody. Great. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, here we go. Thank you, choir. Yeah. Steve, I thought we did a great job. <laughs> Sounds like George Beverly Shea to us up here singing. Please remain standing as you're able for the reading of the gospel. In our second scripture lesson, take him to the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus prays for his future followers. I'm not praying alone, not praying only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their word. I pray they will be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. I pray that they will also be in us, so that the world will believe that you sent me. I've given them the glory that you gave me so that they can be one, just as we are one. I'm in them and you are in me, so that they will be made perfectly one, then the world will know that you have sent me and that you have loved them just as you loved me. Father, I want those who you gave me to be with me where I am. <clears throat> then they can be my glory, which you gave me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, even the world didn't know you but I've known you, and these believers know that you sent me. I have made your name known to them and will continue to make it known <clears throat> so that you will love me for you will be in them, and I myself will be in them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, God. God. You may be seated as we sing our hymn of Prince preparation. I love to tell a story. The world's will be on the screen in your hymnal on page 156.
you've probably heard of the word trouble. For some of you, if it was like me, there were times when you wonder if that's what you named your own kids. But have you ever heard the word good trouble? It's a phrase that has grown in the consciousness of our nation for about the past 50 years, maybe 60. It was coined by the late Congressman John Lewis, towering figure of the civil rights movement. 
It was more than that he just used the phrase, he lived it. We're certainly living in days where there are wrongs that need to be righted. But as we consider our options, we find that, well, what we should do, even what we should say, is not always that clear. We know there are systems in the world that are based on presumptions and prejudices. There are op oppressive patterns, and economic cycles that are, well, impossible to break without outside help. So our question today is not whether we should be dealing with these kinds of things, but how will we respond to them as Jesus would? Or in other words, how will we today make good trouble and disturb the status quo? Some of you are saying, but wait, Pastor Steve, we're not supposed to be political. And for the most part, you're right. So we need a different approach. We're supposed to be about making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Have you ever thought about what a transformed world would look like? What would be difference, different in our world if we lived a vision of what it means to be working toward and co-creating with God the, the kingdom that we all long for? Shall we sing about peace, about making peace, studying war no more? Sure. Shall we pray about ending of hunger and living into God's abundance, even here and now in this fruitful world? Of course. Shall we stand for an end to, to violence between nations and on our streets and in our classrooms and in our homes? Absolutely. Shall we take at least small steps towards living a, a carbon neutral existence so we can clean up the world around us? Maybe even live a plastic free lifestyle. What would that kingdom look like in our neighborhood? What would have to end? What would need to be enhanced? And who is it that we're working with on this vision as we seek to be more kingdom focused in our living and working and planning and even worship? making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation world of the world is the official mission of the United Methodist Church. <coughs> I hope you've heard it before or seen it before. Although it hasn't always been specified, it's been since I went into ministry in 1995 that we've had a, a mission statement. Some of you have some history and mission statements. I don't know about yours. When I started work for real as an engineer in 1985, the Dow Chemical Company had just gotten on board. There's this crazy whack job named Dimming. Can't remember his first name, but he had gone to Japan about 1950 to start help helping rebuild their their economy following the World War II and pretty soon they were doing better than we were. So the big corporate giants had invited Mr. Deming back to the U.S. He was an American after all and said, wait, do this for us. And he said, okay, what's your mission? Mm -hmm. Make money? 
No. And that's the problem, he said. You can't make money as a company unless you know your mission. Well, why is that? Because it's your mission that defines you, directs you, and empowers you. At least that's the idea, that's the plan behind such a statement. Where do mission statements come from, and what do they really mean? If you've had, ever had to work in a, on a committee or a work group to come up with a mission statement for some organization, whether it's church or work or something else, I pity you. It's not an easy job. Mostly because some people consider mission statements to be just absolutely critical. And others find them distracting. They want to focus on their day-to-day -day work. It's hard to come up with a good mission statement. Google mission statement on the internet. And for every example of a good one, you'll get a hundred examples of bad ones. And boy, some of them are bad. I've seen one that was three pages long. <laughs> I've seen ones that were three words long. I've struggled with the need for a mission statement. I know when I, when I went into ministry, the talk was just starting about, oh, well, maybe churches need to have mission statements. Well, I thought, we, we kind of already have one. If you just take a look at what Jesus says. At one point he says, go into all the world. Well, that's pretty mission-oriented, right? Another place, Jesus says, love God and love your neighbor. See, in several places he says that. And you can't get any more mission-y than that. And then do justice, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. Now, the prophet Micah said that, but so it's not from the Gospels, but it sounds like something would, that Jesus would affirm. So if we have all of that, why do we need a mission statement? Why don't we just claim what has already been given us? Well, I came to understand that to claim that statement, that fundamental belief of who we are as a church, as a, as a community of faith in a particular place at a particular time, to claim that statement is hard work. How are we, we going to take whatever these mission statements are and make them into that which not only sounds good and makes us feel good, but more importantly, gets our feet and our hands moving. That's what a mission statement is all about. And I think I see a connection between our denominational statement, which is almost word for word out of the 25th chapter, or 28th chapter of Matthew. But I see a connection between that and the story from our text from the 16th chapter of Acts this morning. Well, maybe stretching it, but it seems compelling to me, so let's take a look at it. Our text from Acts continues the story of Paul on his missionary journey with Timothy and Silas. They're traveling around Macedonia, that's eastern modern Greece. And something interesting has happened as we, as we got on to this journey, and Paul has specific people he's taking with him, he, he switches in telling his story from first person, singular, to first person plural. 
doesn't say I anymore, he says we. And so scholars call this the we group. We were teaching and praying and engaging with the community. Just like you'd expect Paul to. But as they go along, and we don't really find out until later, but they drop Timothy off. Paul and Silas, well, they wind up with a tag along. I never knew that word until I had daughters who were in Girl Scout brownies, and my wife was the leader, and we had Jason, who was just a little guy, and she called him a tag along, and I said, What are you calling my son? Oh, you know, somebody who just follows, you know, doesn't really part of the group, but just follows along. Okay. And admittedly, I don't know how Jason was. He was so cute back then, he, he was probably fine. All the girls were ooing over him. But this woman happened to be particularly irritating. She was like that buzzing fly that just won't go away. This person is a slave girl, and apparently she has a spirit, a gift of divination. We don't know where the gift came from. Is it a good gift, bad gift? We don't know. What we do know is that she, this gift is making a lot of money for those that own her. But at this time, for days, she runs after Paul and Silas like an annoying kid brother or sister who just keeps tagging along and wants to be a part of the cool kids. And she announces, no, she divines really some pretty good stuff. Stuff that Paul himself was ready to say at the right moment. But she kept yelling out, these people are servants of the Most High God. They are proclaiming a way of salvation to you. Now who could be upset by that? That's good news. Paul and Silas are getting free advertising. Maybe you even help with, you know, Paul's voice a little. He doesn't have to say it. The problem is it doesn't feel like much of a deal for Paul and Silas. Her enthusiasm is short-circuiting any opportunity that Paul and Silas have to engage people on a simpler level before they get to the sales pitch. She's giving it away. It's like you're trying to tell a joke, maybe for the 400th time, and your wife interrupts it with the punchline. Not that I've ever experienced that. So day after day, there she was. Always around Paul and Silas. Always with the same tagline. It, it's like a... You're watching your favorite movie. It's a long movie, but at every commercial break, there's the same horrible... commercial. And finally, Paul snaps. turns and he heals her just like that he casts out that spirit of divination effectively shutting up her up for good and that well that's when it hits the fan the owners of the slave girl have just lost their free lunch they are happy so they have Paul and Silas arrested they invent some, some charges that well, may be based on truth, but probably not. Paul and Silas are stripped as a way of humiliating them. They're beaten as a way of extracting a pound of flesh for the loss of income. And they're thrown 
not just into jail, but as one commentator describes it, the jailiest part of the jail. Naturally, being Paul and Silas, in the innermost of the prison, shackled together with chains, they begin singing hymns. Probably some of the good old hits like the old rugged cross or amazing grace. They sing them even though their faces are all bloody and bruised. They sing them even though their bones are bruised and broken. They sing rather than moan. They sing rather than complain. They sing. And all the other prisoners locked up there in that rat-infested darkness listen to them sing. They probably decide, those guys are either crazy or they're saints or something of both. That's when it happened, it being the earthquake. A natural occurrence? Sure, that part of Greece has earthquakes every day. Big ones once in a while. Earthquakes happen. But it's funny the way that Luke chooses to describe the effect of this particular earthquake. I don't know about you, but I, I've been through an earthquake. Remember? Was that about the second year we were in Kendall, uh, uh, Sealyville? I don't know, 2004, something like that. There was a little earthquake centered down around St. Louis somewhere. It woke us up. We knew something had happened. That's the biggest one I've been through. I missed a big one. I was in San Francisco two weeks on a business trip before the big one came in 1989. Glad I wasn't there. But you've seen pictures of what earthquakes do. They knock over buildings and rip holes in the ground and all that sort of thing. But that's not the way Luke describes the effect of this earthquake. He says that the chains became unfastened. They came loose. Not that the chains were shattered. Not that they pulled from the wall or any other accidental freeing effect. Luke uses the very specific word. They came loose. Interesting, don't you think? And yet no one seizes the moment when the doors have opened, the chains have fallen loose, and runs for freedom. Both the gospel singers and their appreciative audience just sit there amongst whatever rubble there was, patiently waiting for whatever comes next. Now jailers at that time were personally responsible for those in jail. And so when the jailer is awoken and he sees that the doors are open, he assumes, oh no, they've all escaped. It's my life anyway. I might as well take it now. Paul hears the scream of the jailer, perhaps that the noise of unsheathing the sword, his ragged breathing like a man on, on the brink of despair, and Paul shouts, wait a minute, we're all here. Put away your sword. The jailer brings light into their darkness and kneels before the men he treated like dirt earlier in the night. And he says, I want what you have that causes you to act like you do. It's pretty much the literal translation of what he said. You ever think about that? I want what you have that causes you to act the way you do. It 
was a strange, out of the ordinary setting. The behavior of these prisoners was, was not normal. It was good trouble. It was offensive to the status quo. And to transform the world. Change is hard. We all know that. We also know that if we try to impose change, change will be resisted. But if we embrace the mission statement, then it is we who are by nature change makers, change bringers. And we will be resisted. We will be ignored. We might even be persecuted. Yet we will persist. We will bring the needed change. We will bring the new kingdom, a new way of living as the human community. Sure, we'll struggle with it at times. Sometimes we'll get it completely wrong. Paul's response to the girl that he's annoyed with is, well, it's not exactly worthy of the Christ he proclaims, but notice even the result is a positive one. We're not perfect vessels of this perfect grace. We will continue, however, to be worthy of the gospel we proclaim. Oh yeah, that part. We are proclaiming the gospel, right? You do make it a point every day in your life to bring about good trouble, to disturb the inadequate peace, to challenge the status quo, to just like our mission statement says. Our mission statement says we're transforming the world. You know what that means? The world can't stay like it is. Paul's released from prison. Goes to the next town. He gets arrested again. The charge against him is even better. These people are turning the world upside down. Anybody ever said that of you? Of your church? And you might need to reread your mission statement. Because that's your job. That's your task. That's what Jesus came for and calls us to continue doing. Turn this world upside down. What better legacy could we leave? We who are making disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. Come on, let's, let's be about good trouble. Let's be about disturbing the peace of our daily lives. Not for the heck of it, not to really cause trouble, but in a way that this world around us, beginning with our neighbors, can transform into the world God intended. So be it. Our response to God's word begins with sharing of our joys and concerns uh, have a few updates um, Robin Spangler's T-cell collection will be this Tuesday the 31st and then she can uh, hopefully they can begin a targeted uh, treatment for her liver cancer uh, Mary Kinsey Wilmert will be having surgery on Thursday for a rare tumor that's behind her stomach. And 
Lonnie French will be having surgery on uh, Wednesday for bladder cancer. And, uh, oh, Marsha's not back. Um, Carolyn Denny, Marsha Weaver's sister, had a stroke on Monday night. Do you know if she's in the still in the hospital? She's in rehab now. Okay. All right. Good for that. Um, any other prayers or joys or concerns that you'd like to share? Start with uh, Pam. Yeah. Pam Barbed. Um, update on our son. He's, as I said to Pam earlier, no news is good news. He's kind of kind of status quo. He is continuing his his counseling, but he's still not willing to consider medication. So that's that's still a priority in everybody's minds but him. Um, I got a text this morning that he went back to work today, um, which is not good, because that that was his major. Um, stressor in life that really put him over the edge, but um, since the doctors wouldn't approve him being off any longer, he decided, okay, fine. He's still looking for another job, so prayers that he will find something to replace this very stressful environment. Um, really positive news, um, I, many have seen on Facebook, as Steve and I have shared, um, our daughter-in-law, Kathy, um, she had a few weeks ago been awarded the Excellence in Education Award for her school. Well, she was named Outstanding Teacher of the Year for the whole school district this week. So major kudos for that. Um, very proud of her um, and all that, all, that she's, all that she's been doing. Um, I think that's it. Kathy's still waiting. Kathy's still waiting. Her her COVID is completely done and over with. She's waiting for appointment to get her injection. Um, in her back. In, in her back, yeah. Um, she, she is out this weekend, out as in right now she's at, at um, the farm, the family farm. Um, she'll be coming out to our house this afternoon and spending the night here. She's limping and hobbling, and uh, but she's doing what she what she can. Lenny, anything from our online viewers? No. Okay. It's pretty quiet on there today. Uh, this is Ray Hedstrom, and uh, a week from Wednesday, three of us are going to travel back to Nicaragua for the first time in two and a half years. Uh, we still have many things to overcome. Uh, a week from Monday, we have COVID testing. Uh, we are flying on a different airline, so we're not sure how that's going to work. Uh, we are going back, and uh, things have changed considerably at the church with the new minister and everything. So as I told Pastor Steve, we're kind of like Peter in that boat, stepping out and walking on that water. Uh, we just want to make sure we keep our eyes where they're supposed to be, but we'd ask that uh, you pray for us and our mission down there and for safe travel and uh, safe COVID testing coming back and uh, travel back. But uh, we would just ask that you remember us. Thank you. This is Terry from the Key. Um, our son Doug texted us this, this past uh, week and said that even though he had both sh COVID shots and both boosters, he said he was feeling kind of down and, and sore throat and fatigue and he gave himself a test and he has COVID. And um, so yeah, even though we are fully vaccinated and everything, there's still that possibility. Uh, of course, he's around things like that a lot, more, especially. Um, but we did get a text saying that he's better, getting better every day. Lenny Penrod here. I wanted to let you know my daughter's home, Mamma Rio, and 
My brother is back in the hospital with another infection on his leg and his foot because he didn't use hers. I would ask me to pray for Wabash Parkview Hospital to get their act together. Um, they keep screwing things up on me for my testing. They do find it and then they correct it, but it just it, it doesn't give me a lot of confidence. I have to have this test on my foot, so give me your prayers, please. Thank you. Anyone else? This week we're praying for the Laketon Wesleyan Church and Pastor David Cox. Card is on the back. If you haven't signed it and would like to, it will be there at the end of the service. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Loving Father, as we gather this day, we we know that things are not right in this world. We see a lot of pain. Questions without answers. Questions with too many answers. People who are ready to fight for this way or that. But Lord, you simply call us to love. Which means we listen openly to others. We see first what it is in our own lives that need changing, that needs transforming. And then we engage others and invite them to do the same. Lord, we don't know how to be good trouble. We only know if trouble is bad. Because trouble makes us change, does things we, we'd rather not do. But Lord, help us to know the good trouble of Jesus Christ, who calls us to change who we are, how we live in this world, how we relate to one another. simply so that we get some reward, but so that then we would be able to share that, that opportunity for change to others. That's what you call us to do in this world, Lord. We're the ones who gave what you said, names, and then let's figure out how to be that name simply call us to love, to love God, and to love our neighbor as ourself. If we would just do that, Lord, this would be such a different world. If we would just, if we would begin with those in our own communities, our own neighborhoods to reach out in love and to offer that opportunity to, to be changed by your love. Lord, I'm tired of hearing what I hear on the nightly news. But I know it's not someone else's fault, it's mine. I haven't done what I could have done. I've never been to Buffalo, I've never been to Uvalde. But if I don't do what I can right here, why would others do it where they are? Forgive me, Lord. Push me, kick me, whatever I need. To allow your spirit to transform me into who you 
created me to be. A person who, who has nothing but love, even for the most despicable and vile of this world. It's hard, Lord. You told us it would be hard. We'd rather go the easy way and blame somebody else. But Lord, it's not somebody else's fault that we don't love as we are loved. Guide us. Love us, Lord. So that we can share that love with the world. And now, Lord, hear our voices as we raise them together in the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and our offering. Our offering sentence this morning comes from the fifth chapter of James. Your riches have rotted. Moths have destroyed your clothes. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you. It will eat your flesh like fire. Consider the treasure you have hoarded in the last days. Let us consider these words as we give of ourselves, our tithes, and our offerings.
Lord, we give thanks for all your gifts, especially the gift of your love. Help us to give of ourselves in our love. Please remain standing as we sing our hymn of meditation, Lift High the Cross. The words will be on the screen in your hymnal on page 159. join me in our blessing. Go out into the world, and in your words and in your lives, bear witness to the Christ who has ascended to be everywhere present. Let all the world see the love of God at work within you and in you. And as you come to know him, may God give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation. May Christ Jesus lift up his hands and bless you. And may the Spirit open to you all the riches of Christ's inheritance. We may go in peace to love and serve God in the name of Christ. And we go knowing that it is the Christ of cross, the cross of Christ that we carry, which is the love of God for you and for me and for all. Let us carry that light, loving burden into a hurting and sorrowful world. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.